decision making, knowing God's uh, will. I, I can just tell you that I, I've seen uh, more harm done to uh, believers uh, in Jesus Christ through bad decisions that actually than, than outward sin. Uh, you know, it does happen that people walk away from the Lord. It does happen that people fall into sin. But a lot of, a lot of good Christians just can make some very bad decisions and then reap the consequences of those decisions for, uh, for many years. Some of you invested heavily in the stock market, for example. No, don't raise your hand. But uh, bad decisions sometimes, and we reap the, the, uh, the consequences. But, uh, and so this becomes a very important chapter. Moses is very careful to point out to us that at the beginning of the chapter, which we actually covered uh, last week, or the beginning of this episode, of course, there were no chapter breaks when he was writing it. But at the beginning of this episode, he frames it like bookends with Moses is in an altar and he's worshiping the Lord. and He's right with God again and he's calling on the name of the Lord after the whole debauchal uh, that took place there in Egypt in his own testing and failure in faith. Uh, and then at the end of this episode, we're going to find him at an altar again and worshiping the Lord uh, once again. And what, in, what is in between is a problem that arises between him and his nephew Lot. And there's going to be some decisions that are made on both of these men's behalf uh, that we can learn greatly from. So let's take a look at uh, how it begins. It's a problem of possessions that actually force the decision of verses 5 to 9. Again, we're in Genesis 13. Lot also, who went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. Now the land was not able to support them, that they might dwell together, for the processions were so great that they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of Lot's livestock. The Canaanites and the Parasites then dwelt in the land. So Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me and between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brethren. Is not the whole land before you. Please separate, yourself, uh, separate from me. If you take the left, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. So again, the problem is created by their prosperity. So God has blessed them. Uh, and they are both really uh, become, are becoming rich, rich men at this point. Uh, and it creates a problem for them. It's, it's usually, that's the situation. Uh, it's really not uh, in those times of desperation where we're, we're crying out, out to the Lord that there's really an issue with our relationship uh, with, with the Lord. We're just uh, uh, with some of the folks in the church and praying for one of the guys that uh, is in a kind of a hospice situation and uh, near the end of his life. And as he goes through a lot of pain and periods, uh, uh, you know, I asked him, so how, how is your relationship with the Lord? And he says, oh, I'm crying out to the Lord all the time. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's those times that, that you do. Uh, it's the times of prosperity that we can really fail, that we can really make some bad decisions. Uh, now, Lot himself had really piggybacked on Abram. I mean, Lot's just the, he's just the, He's just the tag along in a sense. He's the younger. He's the nephew. He comes along. He decides to journey with Abraham. You know, at this juncture, when this dispute breaks out, it would have been a pretty reasonable thing for Lot to just go, well, listen, Abraham, um, you tell me what to do. I mean, you know, really, I don't, I don't have anything that didn't come from you anyway. The only reason I've got anything is because I'm with you and God's blessing you. And, and I'm, uh, you know, I, I'm part of the deal here. So... Uh, what do you think we should do, Uncle Abraham? How should we handle this? What would you like me to do? That would, that would have been a reasonable thing. But uh, we, we don't see that. Something has really gone astray in Lot's heart. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, love this line, He who loves silver will not be satisfied with silver, nor he who loves abundance with increase. This is also vanity. You know, you, you can think that having things, whatever it is, uh, is going to be this thing that satisfies you. Uh, whether it's a particular position, a promotion, a career, a home, a possession, you know, whatever, whatever it might be. You can think that certain things in this life could bring real satisfaction. But the Bible says that very differently. Paul gives these instructions to uh, young Timothy as he's pastoring the church in Ephesus in 1 Timothy 6.10. He says, for the love of money, not money, but for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil for which some have strayed from the faith 
in their greediness and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. No, again, the money, the riches is not the problem because Abraham's probably got more, but it's not an issue for him because it's not what his life is all about because he's at this altar in this place of surrender uh, before the Lord. Uh, Lot had not learned the lesson that Abraham had going down to Egypt. And Lot, I would say, his herdsmen, they're quarreling. Uh, they're probably not doing that on their own. They're probably taking a few cues from their boss. And uh, I think we're seeing that uh, uh, lived out in their lives, which is often the case. Uh, again, when we're hurting, we're going through difficulty. We have a tendency to draw close to the Lord. Not so in prosperity. One writer said, need produces a poverty of spirit that reaches up for help and out to one another. And, and uh, certainly the kids there in the Tohoku area and seeing the tremendous devastation there uh, witness those people gathering together, reaching out to one another. That, that is the case. That is our tendency. Our problem often is in prosperity. But notice, secondly, it's a problem of the heart. It's been said many times, the heart of every problem is a problem of the heart. Lot's heart was centered on wealth and worldly achievement. Abraham was simply trying to live a life at that point to please the Lord. Notice also that the Canaanites and parasites are in the Lord. Just kind of thrown in there. I don't think it's by accident. Uh, their relationship, these two brothers in the Lord, their lives are being observed. How would they handle this? How would their relationship be sustained? You know, a lot of people watch our relationships as well. Uh, they they want to see. And, and uh, to tell you the truth, if we can't get our relationships with one another right, we got no business telling any, anybody else about our relationship with Jesus Christ. I mean, that's, this is really where, where the rubber meets the road. It's easy to say, I love God, right? And I have a good relationship with him. But the way we show it is in our relationship with one another. We're going to see here who really is rightly related to the Lord. Uh, James has a couple of things to say about this, but in James 4, 1, it says, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? It's our own selfish nature that creates the quarreling and the problem as it does with Lot. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight in war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss, or as the NIV would say, with wrong motives, that you may spend it on your pleasures. Lots of troublemaker uh, and not a peacemaker because he had heart trouble. Uh, the third thing is the gracious solution to the problem. Uh, Abraham simply says, well, we'll just separate then and you can have whatever you want. <laughs> that, that ends a lot of arguments if you haven't tried that yet. Uh, uh, when I, uh, back in the day when I used to be a, a, an assistant manager for Safeway over there uh, in Enchanted Lakes, one of the things that I had to deal with was uh, customer complaints, right? You, know, you always get sent to see the manager, you know? And uh, it would be, uh, you know, all kinds of things. People's eggs that broke or bread that got smashed or the thermometer didn't work on the oven, so the cake burnt, and you know, you, you name it, you know, you get the, the variety. But uh, my training and the way I was taught, and for my own survival's sake, is that complaint needed to end with me right there. I did not want that complaining person to go over my head to my boss, because now I'm in trouble. Uh, if they go over his boss, he's in trouble. Now I'm really in trouble, and this whole thing ricochets. If you wanna really get somebody's attention, therefore, a tip, ask to see the manager. You have a lot better shot of trying to get something done. My line, what would you like me to do? How can I make this right? We appreciate your business. Is there anything I can do to correct this situation? You name it, it's yours. You, you, you got had a loaf of bread smashed? I'll give you three. We just appreciate you. You know why it was easy? It wasn't my money. <laughs> give you anything you want. How about your stuff? Is it yours? Or is it the Lord's? Is it easy just to give away? What do you, I'm just so sorry. What would you like me to do? Here, you can have it. You know, there's a lot of quarrels that are ended when we really have our eyes on the Lord and recognize we're just a steward of what he's given us. Abraham was a rich guy. God had blessed him. He knew where it came from. See, we can start thinking it was us. Well, I've worked hard all my life, you know. Really, who gave you the determination? Who gave you the skill set? Who gave you the abilities? Who gave you the motivation? 
Who gave you the perseverance? God. So where would it have really come from anyway? It was from him. You know, just to recognize the Lord in our life and what he's done. And we're going to see this with Abraham as we end. He's a guy that whatever happens, he's going to be back at that altar and giving thanks to the, to the Lord. But what a change from the calculating schemer of Egypt to now. Uh, and I like Abraham because he's absolutely a schizophrenic believer, as most of us are. You know, I mean, there's one moment where he's scheming and deceiving and trying to figure out and, uh, and so forth. And, and then there's other times when he is just so right on and he's willing to go through this. And he's got such a great peace in his heart because he's just trusting God. And uh, it's all from God. It's all his. He's got God's promises. He's going to rely upon him. And what a, what a different man he is in this particular episode. And, and keep in mind, in this patriarchal society, he does not have to do this. I mean, he can just say lot to lot, uh, nephew lot, go away now. <laughs> you get nothing. <laughs> it's all mine anyway. Uh, he could have said, see that spot about 50 miles out there? It's very sandy. That's yours. All the green part is mine. I mean, he, he could have called his shots and been totally within his legal right uh, to do that. But instead, notice his language in verse 8. So Abram said to Lot, please let there be no strife. Verse 9, please separate from me. If you take the left, I will go to the right. Twice, twice he uses this uh, word, please or I, I pray you. He makes an appeal based on the fact that they are, uh, they are brothers. Men should not quarrel, let brothers alone. In his later years, uh, General William Booth, the founder of the uh, Salvation Army, if you haven't ever read a biography about his life, it's a great, uh, great story, a tremendous man of God, unable to attend the conferences that the Salvation Army would have every year, and back in those days would send a cable wherever they were meeting in the world to uh, address uh, those that had gathered. In one year, he sent a cable that only had one word, and it said, others. That's what our ministry is to be all about. And that was certainly what we see exemplified in the life of Abraham here. How could he allow his younger nephew to make this decision? Because that's what's going on here. He's got to make a decision how to handle it. Lot's going to have to make a decision as well. But he wasn't worried about the the future, was he? I think of the, uh, the virtuous woman of Proverbs 31. There's a line in there describing her saying that she can laugh at the days to come. What does that mean? It means she can trust the Lord for the future. Whatever happens, whatever comes their way, she, she, whatever the circumstances, she knows that all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purposes. Jesus put it this way, certainly echoed in the life of Abraham in Matthew 6, but seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. And I would say amen to that. There's, a, there's enough in one day to deal with. Do we really need to start worrying about next week and next year and so forth? Uh, there's a proverb that talks about the righteous man and how he does not fear sudden destruction. And there's a lot of the what ifs that can go through our minds that are sometimes, you know, just our own lack of faith and sometimes an attack from the enemy that can get us not trusting God and not trusting him for the future. But when we put the Lord first, seek first the kingdom of God. If you read it in context, suggest that you do. Uh, it's really just talking about the everyday material things of life your house and where you live and your stuff and all of that. Jesus says, if you'll seek me first uh, and what you should be doing with your life on my behalf and live your life for me in that way, then all this other stuff is going to be taken care of as well. But like the proverb or the Ecclesiastes passage, if you seek after that stuff first, it's just going to take wings and fly away anyway. Uh, the person that seeks silver will never be satisfied uh, with it. Abraham was holding on to a promise given back in chapter 12, verse 7, to your descendants, I will give the land. In some ways, if, if we're thinking like Abraham, it was an easy decision. A lot you can choose whatever you want because it really doesn't matter because wherever I go, God's going to bless me. If you go this way, I'll just go this way and God will bless me. 
If you go that way, I'm going to go this way because God's going to bless me. He's going to watch over me. He's made some promises to me, and I believe them, and, uh, and I trust them. I haven't always in the past, but I've spent enough time in front of an altar worshiping him, and that sacrifice that was burned on the altar and that smoke that went up, that was representative of my life. I want to try to live it in total dedication to him. And when I do that, I've got a real peace in my heart. That's hard to do sometimes, and he doesn't always get it right, but he certainly has it right here. So there's a problem of possessions that actually force a decision. And then notice also in verse 10 to 13, it's the appearance of the plains of Jordan. And they end up influ influencing Lot. Verse 10, and Lot lifted up his eyes and saw the plain of Jordan that is well watered everywhere. And then parenthesis, before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go toward Zoar. Now Moses, again, very carefully writing, there's, a, there's an ominous tone to this. It's like Eden. Oh yeah, the judgment was there. It's like Egypt. Oh yeah, there's judgment that's coming there. It's like Zoar. Yeah, there's judgment coming there as well. Very, very interesting. But Lot notices he's not seeking the Lord. Then Lot chose for himself all the plain of Jordan and Lot journeyed east. And they separated from each other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelt in the land of the cities of the plain, and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. They weren't just sinful, and they weren't just wicked. Uh, Moses, again, very careful. They were exceedingly wicked and sinful. There's an, there's an ominous thing going on. The storm clouds are gathering over the heads of, of, of Lot as he heads this way and he makes this decision. But notice he lifted his eyes towards the plain of Jordan. This is in contrast to we'll see Abraham lifting his eyes to heaven to hear from the Lord and wait on the Lord. But he sees it. It looks good to him. Makes all the sense in the world. After all, it's well watered. It's green. It's beautiful. And they're, they're about 3,000 feet up there in Bethel. They could walk about a mile and a mile half from where they were camped and look out over a precipice and see the entire Jordan Valley. And it would have been breathtaking and beautiful. It's beautiful. It looks good to me. I'll take it. And sometimes, you know, we make bad decisions that way. From my perspective... Sure looks like a good idea. That promotion, that place, live here, go there, whatever it might be, this school for my kids, whatever big decisions that we have to make. From my perspective, looking down, it all looks, looks good to me. But it wasn't, was it? But uh, again, never seeking the Lord. We would note that Lot had a tent, but never, never had an altar in his life. Instead of lifting up his eyes to heaven, he looked at the plains of Jordan, and notice it reminded him of Egypt. He'd gotten a taste of uh, life in Egypt, which was a life away from the Lord. But what an opportunity that he missed out. How he could have just said, no, Abraham, it's, it's, uh, I'm just going to follow you. I'll go wherever you go. You think of uh, Ruth the Moabite. What a contrast coming with her uh, mother-in-law Naomi in, the, in a time also of real testing, you know. Uh, I'll go with you. Your God will be my God. Your people will be my people, and so forth. But uh, he doesn't do it. What a, what, a, what a great opportunity. Can you imagine walking with Abraham, being a friend of Abraham, sitting around the campfire with Abraham? All the experiences. God's not done with them. There's all these things that are going to happen. A journey of faith that he could have had, and he's going to walk away from it at this point. You know why? He thinks he knows better. <laughs> he thinks he knows better, uh, and, uh, and, and it's so sorry because he doesn't. Notice it was first a glance, or it was a look in verse 10. He looked towards Sodom. Uh, later, we'll see that he moved towards Sodom in verse 11 and 12. When we get to chapter 14, we find that he moves into Sodom, and by the time we get to chapter 19, we find him uh, uh, as the two angels that are coming in judgment 
they came to Sodom in the evening and Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. Sitting in the gate, and you remember that in those days, the gate of the city was actually a large room. In many cases, about half the size of this room, benches all the way around. There would be an entrance uh, in one side and then an exit into the city that way. Two purposes, if somebody was going to storm the gates like they do in the movies, it was really never like that. Big wooden gates, if you get open, you right into the courtyard and you bust through. They didn't build gates that way. If they got in the gate, now they were in an enclosed room and there were places up, little tiny openings above where archers could be up there and nail guys coming in. Those little openings are called peepholes. Very interesting. <laughs> and they could catch them. And it, it prevented them from being able to, in a sense, break directly into the city. But the benches that were in there were in there because that's where the elders sat. That's where they went and made decisions. So we've got Lot looking on the plains of Jordan. It seems very beautiful to my eyes. I'm not really consulting the Lord uh, because, you know, I got this, Lord. I'm doing pretty good. I can just call the shots here on my own. So it looks good to my eyes. That's enough of a decision that I need. I'm moving there. In fact, I'm going to move a little further towards Sodom. In fact, I'm going to move into Sodom. And now I'm so politically correct in this corrupted situation that he's in. He gets elected to the city council. He's sitting in the gate of the city. It's quite a, quite a transition when he could have been with Abraham during this entire time. Notice also the appearance of the plane. Plane certainly influenced him. He mentions uh, Egypt there. It's like Egypt because of, of the Nile. He saw the well-watered plain as, a, in a sense, like a, a paradise. Notice also Moses very carefully in verse 11 points out he journeyed east. To do that, he would have to turn his back on Bethel, the house of God. He would move in the direction of Ai, to a place of destruction. Yes, it's symbolic, but Moses has got it there for a reason. Anytime we're walking away from God, we're walking away from light, and we're walking into darkness, and he's literally uh, doing it. Uh, again, Lot's choice was by sight alone, and we need to be very careful when we make decisions. New job? Well, hey, it's more money. It's, that's got to be God, right? Not necessarily. You know, it's, you know, uh, I've seen some people make some very bad decisions and, and see them, uh, uh, you know, then have the repercussions for it. I've seen some guys make some, some really good decisions. There was a, a young guy uh, that was in the church a number of years ago who was, uh, it was, uh, was a pilot. He had been a, a Marine Tomcat pilot. I first met him, and we were talking a little bit. And uh, he was flying Gulf Streams out here at the time with the Navy. And I said, well, how did, how did that come about? He said, well, I had a little mishap in the Tomcat. And I know what a mishap was, but I just kind of had to get him to tell me the rest of the story. Mishap, like it crashed. And he goes, yeah. And I go, can you talk about it? He goes, they did on CNN, so I guess I can. <laughs> and he tells me the whole story. He's uh, in uh, outside Pennsylvania somewhere, making his last turn in uh, for his final approach. Uh, both engines, uh, his engines go and he drops like a rock and his plane takes out about four homes to a residential area. His chute drops in the middle of a ball of fire. He rolls and tumbles, runs out, got his flight suit on, got his helmet on. He's, he's unscathed and now the realization of how many people did I just kill with my jet. Uh, as it turns out, no one was home in any of those homes and many of them were Christians and he wasn't. So they invited him to church the next week, and he was happy to go, thankful to be there, but that they would reach out to him in any way whatsoever, although totally not his, his fault at all. It was just one of those things. Each of them got up and explained why they were normally home right then with their children, except that there was a dentist appointment, except that a neighbor called, except that, and everybody God sovereignly had removed out of the path of that F-14. Didn't become a Christian right then, but sure got him thinking. <laughs> and eventually he surrendered his life to the Lord and really surrendered his life to the Lord to the point that God gave him a wife and two beautiful little kids and now is switching over to the Navy side, flying these beautiful Gulf Streams. And he's up for loot from lieutenant commander to commander. And he says, you know, it's a, tell me if I'm crazy or not, but I kind of been hoping for this my whole life, this next, next move up. And now I'm thinking, I don't want it. Am I going crazy? Because I'm looking at my boss and he's gone more than I am. Uh, and I got two little kids at home. Am, am I going crazy here? Or 
Tell, tell me, he's kind of saying, tell me what to do. And I'm telling him, you pray about it. Because God maybe wants you to have a higher position where you can have greater influence. And maybe that's what he wants. Or maybe you're hearing from him. And you need to seek the Lord. And uh, it, it was a, not to go into the rest of the story, but it was awesome. He ended up pulling his name off the list, did not get the promotion. And then God kind of backdoored him into this whole thing. And he ended up being the basically the, the guy that ran the entire program and it just walked him into this incredible career that he's still uh, in today and we're able to stay in contact, walking with God, part of a great church back in uh, North Carolina, raising his kids and stuff. But, uh, you know, he just kind of surrendered what, to what a lot of people would have just said, promotion? <laughs> Absolutely. Every time, all the time, what else would I want? But, you know, we need to seek the Lord. And not just look on something with eyesight and assume that that's what God has for us. We've got uh, uh, one, of, one of our guys praying a promotion board this month. And uh, we're, I'm praying uh, for him to get promoted or for God's will to be done, whatever that is. And that's what he's praying for as well. And I think that's, that's awesome. Of course, I think the Marines need their heads examined if he doesn't get promotion, know, knowing him. But uh, uh, at the same time, Tough decisions that we have. What do we do? How do we handle decisions? Sometimes they're brought on by God's blessings. One of the prophets, Haggai, says at one point in time with the children of Israel, God says, I fed them when they were in the desert, in the land of the burning heat. When I fed them, they became satisfied. When they were satisfied, they became proud. Then they forgot me. You know, sometimes the hardest times is when we're experiencing God's blessing. The problem starts with possessions. The appearance of the plains of Jordan have a bad impact upon Lot. Let's take a look at the promise of the land and how Abraham is able to hold on to that. It becomes a great demonstration of his faith. Verse 14, And the Lord said to Abram, After Lot had separated from him, Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and westward. For all the land which you see I give to you and your descendants forever. And I will make your descendants as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could number the dust of the earth, then your descendants also could be numbered. Arise, walk in the land through its length and its width, for I give it to you. Then Abram moved his tent and went and dwelt by the terabith tree of Mamre, which are in Hebron, and built an altar there to the Lord. So he lifts up his eyes at God's command and receives his promise. Verse 14 Lift your eyes now and look from the place where you are. Quite the contrast, Lot looking at the plains of Jordan and saying it just looks good to me. We might say that's the lust of the eyes. Uh, I want it. It's for me. It's not. What do you think, Abraham? And maybe we sh should seek the Lord. This looks, you know, good down here, but, you know, I don't really know. I don't know if you've come to that conclusion yet that God's smarter than you are. You know, it, you, know, I, you know, you can really actually become a Christian, I confess. You can become a Christian, walk with the Lord, and still somehow think God doesn't really know you that well. You know, he knows you in a general sense, like he knows everybody in a general sense. But he doesn't know the particulars of your thinking and your abilities and so forth. So you do need to kind of help him out once in a while. He doesn't always really realize your particular situation. So you can't really totally surrender and consult him on things because after all he's busy running the universe but actually God can handle your little life <laughs> and comprehend your little thoughts all uh, all along and uh, you know and when we consult him it's amazing uh, the outcome Abraham lifts up his eyes at God's command and he receives his promise now, what happened to the land that Lot chose? Well, he chose a piece of land that he finally lost. You remember the rest of the story. We'll get there by chapter 19. He's got to flee. And there's a little thing called fire and brimstone that comes down and absolutely destroys this area. And there's not a lot there today. It pretty much looks, uh, looks the same. What happened to the land that was promised to Abraham? It still belongs to his descendants. And we are fortunate enough to live in a time prophetically when they are back in that land. Once again, his physical descendants, the Jewish people. <clears throat> Notice that Lot said, I will take. Abraham said, I will give. 
Proverbs 10, 22 says, the blessings of the Lord make one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. So again, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God and he's blessing, then you can go, it's all the Lord's and he's blessed and I give him the praise for, for what he's done. You know, but if it's all about you and what you've done and your stuff and your deal, you know, you're, you're gonna be worried about it all, all the time as well. But uh, when he gives it, there's no sorrow with it. Abraham listens to God's promise, again, of numerous descendants, and the multiplication of Abraham's descendants, too numerous to count. Later in chapter 15, there'll be another comparison. Uh, this one is, every time you walk, Abraham, you can look at the ground and see that dust and know that your descendants will be more than that. And that will remind you of this promise. Then in chapter 15, every time you're around that campfire at night and you look up at those stars, that'll be the reminder as well because your descendants will be more numerous than the stars in, uh, in the heavens. The promise included a command to walk. Lift up your eyes and look, and then lift up your feet and walk. Some very early Jewish commentaries say that this was a symbolic act signifying legal acquisition of the land. In other words, you're purchasing a piece of property, then you would walk it, the, uh, the length and the breadth of it, to signify that it was really your, yours. It was like signing, signing the deed or, or having the deed recorded in a sense. Uh, and Abraham does. Now, at this, this moment, did all the Canaanites and the parasites just went, well, we kind of heard that God gave you this whole thing, so that's, we're good with that, we're out of here. No, I don't think they really did that. I think they were pretty much still there. And I think there were still a lot of threats uh, on Abraham and his life and his descendants. Oh, by the way, they really weren't descendants yet because his wife is barren and that's another issue. And so he's really trusting God, isn't he? He's trusting God for something God's going to do in the future, not something he was experiencing right there. Uh, that is what faith is, which by the way, I hate living by faith. I don't know if you do. I mean, we can talk about it, but I really would rather not. I would rather actually have the money in the bank and then we can go buy stuff as opposed to trusting God that there's going to be money in the bank so that in the future we can buy stuff. I'm not sure which you're more comfortable with. I'm a little more comfortable with the here and now. But you see what he's, it, this, is, it, this is a real demonstration of faith. God says, I'm giving this to you. It may not look it. You may not see it out there right now. And Abram's like, I'm good with that. I'm walking the land because I trust you. I'm signing the deed. I believe you. In fact, when Lot wants some of it, he can have anything I want. He wants because you're going to bless me whichever way I go. And uh, Jesus says, I've gone to prepare a place for you. We got, a great, we got a great place as well. Can you see it? No. But can we walk around believing it, knowing that's there? Absolutely. Are we really trusting the promises of God? What a great lesson from Abraham. And then the final response was to build an altar. Command was to lift up your eyes, then lift up your feet. And now he lifts up his heart and he works, worships God. And it's with, with thanksgiving. And uh, what a wonderful end or the book uh, marks of this, uh, this whole episode with, with him. Uh, two extremes of Abraham, in a sense, from the last episode to, to this one. And uh, like I said, we, we lived in the same kinds of shoes. But when we really are trusting the Lord, certainly it's those times that we have the great peace in our hearts. One writer said, just trusting God's word will constrict your soul. It will reduce you to the smallest compass. And your life will be of very little use, much like that of, of Lot. Now... <laughs> The only reason that we know a lot as a believer is because they tell, <laughs> there's two writers that tell us that in the New Testament. Otherwise, I kind of write this guy off a long time ago. But one of them talks about how living in Sodom, his righteous soul was vexed daily because of the wickedness that he saw around him. It's like, okay, but how does it all work out for Lot? Well, again, he marches out of the city at the command of the angels. He does believe them. They kind of grab him by the, by the scruff of his neck. He makes it out with his, with his two daughters. His wife turns back. She suffers the judgment of God. How did that all work out, this decision of not consulting God or not even humbling himself with, his, uh, with Uncle Abraham, whom he had everything he owed to? Well, he lost everything. He gets nothing. Still a believer, he still gets saved. He doesn't suffer the judgment of God. We don't want to be that kind of believer. We want to be the, the, the Abraham kind of believer with a peace in our heart and uh, experiencing God's blessing 
because we can trust his promises. Four principles just to uh, leave you with, and you'll, uh, you'll be really blessed to, actually, to, to know that I actually had 16, but uh, <laughs> kind of narrowed it down to four. So uh, we'd actually done a, another message one time on uh, 10 questions to, to ask in order to know God's will. Is it in the Bible? Is it a sin? Basic questions you ought to be asking. Do you have a piece about it? It's not just asking one of those questions. It's the combination that helps you uh, discern God's will. But uh, again, four principles here. Uh, one, we must first place, place our lives on the altar in order to know God's will. Now, we see that with Abraham. That's the whole thing of the sacrifice. It was totally consumed. Now, Paul speaks about that in the New Testament in Romans 12. Uh, keep in mind the fact that if, if we want God to direct us, wouldn't it be kind of a good thing if we were already obeying what he told us to do? Uh, if you, uh, I, you know, again, I did stained glass work for about 20 years, and I'd have some uh, guys come along once in a while that would want to, quote, apprentice with me or learn from me or whatever. And once in a while, I would, I would uh, work with somebody uh, a little bit and so forth. It was always a little disheartening after having done it for a very long time to try to explain something to someone that wanted to learn. And the first thing they said was, well, I don't know if I would always do it that way. Okay, then, why don't you kind of go down the street and do that then? <laughs> You're the one that came to me, remember? But, you know, again, if we're, if we're not, if we have no, no plans in obeying God, why would he tell us what to do? So, th so there's really got to be a surrender here if he's going to direct our lives. That, does that kind of make sense? Paul puts it this way. I beseech you, brother. He says, I beg you. Therefore, and he's just laid out this whole thing about how much God loves us and so forth. Uh, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies <clears throat> as a living sacrifice. So that's the, uh, we're not going to put ourselves on an altar, but in a sense we are. We're saying that we're the, being totally dedicated to you. Holy and acceptable, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And I, NIV says reasonable act of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, because that's our tendency. J.B. Phillips' translation says, don't let the world press you into its mold. Because there's a world system that will try to get you to think a certain way and act a certain way. So you can be acceptable to everybody that's around you. And it will press you into its mold. He says, don't, don't let the world do that to you. But be transformed, be changed. Metamorphosis. By the renewing of your mind. How is our mind renewed? It's not by putting garbage in there. I can, I can tell you that. It's, it's through the word of God. It's the Holy Spirit working through the holy word of God to bring transformation. Paul, addressing the church at, uh, at Ephesus, uh, tells them that they should wash their mind with the word of God. Uh, and that's what we need to do. I was of that, that generation that wanted to have an open mind to everything. And I can tell you, if you have an open mind long enough, it'll be filled with a lot of garbage. And I needed my brain washed. And, uh, uh, and, uh, and, and really, God did that and is continuing the process through his word. Transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and what? The perfect will of God. Want to know what God's will is for your life? Start with uh, these instructions in Romans 12. Place your life on the altar in order to know God's will, like Abraham did. Secondly, we must be willing to surrender our future to the Lord and learn to trust him. And certainly, Abraham did that, wasn't he? I mean, it was like, uh, here's God's promises. Here's the future. Uh, I'm going to hang on to the promise. Uh, a lot, you can have what you want, do what you want. Let there not be quarreling uh, among us. He was certainly trusting God. Psalm 37, 37, mark the blameless man and observe the upright. For the future of that man is peace. But the transgressor shall be destroyed together. The future of the wicked shall be cut off. So uh, again, it's uh, the peace that comes when we're trusting the Lord for the future. Kind of the classic verse about the future certainly is Jeremiah 29, 11. And it is given to Israel in a time of their backsliding. Jeremiah is, uh, is there, starts out a young guy, 18 years old, there at the, the temple, calling the people back uh, to repentance, hoping that they would turn, uh, does it for 40 years. We would say not a big successful ministry because he doesn't have a lot of people uh, obey him. Uh, and, uh, and yet at the same time, so faithful to God. But he says this to backsliding uh, Israel. 
For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. That's another requirement. Seeking the Lord with all of our heart. James, again in the New Testament, says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. And the picture of that is given by Jesus in Luke 15, 20, of the young prodigal who leaves his father, takes his inheritance, blows it all, uh, and ends up uh, uh, eating in a pigsty in order to have something to eat. Then in a sense, comes to his senses. He repents. He rehearses his own mind. I'm going to back to my father. I'm going to tell him I've done wrong. He's, he's, he's going over in his mind this repentance. I'm going to change. And of course, as he heads that way in verse 20, it says that he got up and went to his father. And when his father saw him a long ways off, his heart was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. And Jesus says, that's a picture of God. Uh, there was an old song written called The Day God Ran, because that's a picture of what God will do for us anytime we will come to him, seek him and find him when we search for him with all of our, our heart. Three, is what you're praying for motivated by the word or by the world? Uh, Abraham was holding on to the promises of the word and Lot was again looking at the world. Abraham was waiting to hear from God his choice was, was not motivated by a selfish desire. Ask your question, does it lead to pride or does it lead to humility? Does it appeal to your flesh or does it appeal to your spirit? Paul says in uh, Philippians 2, 3, let nothing be done through selfish ambition. If what you're getting ready to decide is about your selfish ambition, you're probably in trouble already, like Lot. Let nothing be done in selfish ambition or, or conceit. Again, NIV says vain conceit. But in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And by the way, that's a quality of a great leader right there as well. Somebody that is looking out for the interest of others and his guys in, or gals in, uh, in particular, putting others first, not seeking a selfish ambition uh, in any way, a great principle to live by. Again, is this decision something that uh, appeals to our flesh or to the spirit? Fourthly, can we be thankful however the Lord might direct? Now, in the end, Abraham just says, well, Lot, whatever you want. Trusting God for the future is going to bless me either way, so I'm good with whatever happens in the future. And in the end, then, lifts up his eyes, hears from the Lord, and the first thing he does is thank the Lord. Builds an altar, begins to worship the Lord. Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5.18 in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. What's the will of God for all of us? <laughs> to give thanks. For everything? For, for everything. And that's hard to do sometimes. Because sometimes bad things happen to us. And we go through difficult times. And it's really hard to give God thanks unless, unless we really trust God. And we've really come to know him and know that he always has our best interest in mind if we really know that he truly is has a future for us and wants to uh, take care of us watch over us never leave us never forsake us uh, it's it's in those times that it's the hardest times it's probably the most important time to to worship God so tough tough decisions being made here one decision for lot leads in absolute total devastation he's still a believer Apparently he's going to be in, be in heaven. Won't be a big crowd around him. <laughs> you know, you get to heaven, it's like, I want to see David. I want to see Abraham. Probably not going to be a big crowd around Lot. But, uh, you know, but, uh, but he's there. And then, the, and then there's Abraham, who is able to just absolutely trust God for what he has for him. Whatever, whatever we have, Lord, your will be done, not my will be done, in a sense, is what he's able to say. Because, Lord... I believe that you're going to bless me wherever I go. Now, here's the key. Do you really think God's going to bless you wherever you go? We, we need to. And there's an enemy that says, no, he's not, because you're not a good enough Christian. What's a good enough Christian? We're all saved by the same grace and the same blood of Jesus Christ, and that's it. And there's, there's nothing else that gets added onto it. And we have this misconception sometimes that I'm not good enough for God to bless me. 
And we actually need to live with the anticipation of God blessing us because he wants to. And uh, uh, are you like that with your kids? You're just so thrilled when you have the opportunities to bless them. But there's, you know, it's like, okay, I can do the grandfather thing now. There is nothing better than blessing your grandkids, probably even better than blessing your kids. But uh, some of you are going to have to wait a long time for that. But um, uh, it's just an awesome thing. You know, and it's, it teaches you a little bit about God's heart for us. Looking for, wanting to. What's our problem? We don't trust him. But you know what? He is absolutely trustworthy. I just encourage you, when, when Mark's leading us and we're seeing, singing these songs, if you think about the lyrics, a lot of them were about our surrendering our life to the Lord, our trusting the Lord. Really, really sing those songs. Really make that your prayer. And, and if you're not there, say, Lord, help me with this because I should trust you more. Lord, if I think of all that you've done for me, not just my salvation, but for what you've done in my family or whatever the circumstances are of your life, the health that you have, there's always something to give thanks for. If you make those songs and own those songs and really worship the Lord, that, that'll become the bookends of your life of, of making good decisions as well. Because we need to be reminded sometimes of how good God is. Amen. We will see everything we've done. We live in water and run.